Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the prototype device that we're using, why we went the direction we've gone with our prototype, and then I'll talk to you about the algorithm that we're using for detection. Uh, so the focus of this effort was really on developing sensor packages that could be very small, so you could widely distribute them across an area in order to monitor changes in the chemical composition of the air in that area. So you could think of doing that in an urban environment, or since we work for the Navy, you can think of doing that, for example, in a port situation where you're concerned about um, attacks from unsavory characters. All right, so in this case, we're using colorimetric detection, and we're doing it with porphyrin and metalloporphyrin variants. Um, and you might be familiar with colorimetric detection for chemical threats that progresses this way, but typically what you see is something like I'm showing in the top corner here, which is you take an image of a pristine coupon and then you expose that coupon and you take another image. And that doesn't really work if you're talking about uh, long-term devices and it doesn't really work if you want something that will run quite light so you don't have a processor. We don't even want to run something like a Raspberry Pi. We want to be able to put this out and leave it running for weeks at a time without really going to attend it. Uh, so we're using uh, these little devices that report an RGB value. It is not the same as your, your color scale, but you can think of it in that way. And so what we're getting is, like this graph, um, red, green, and blue color values over time. Uh, and we're doing that in this case with a package of six indicators for this original prototype. When we get a little further in, I'll show you a different package that has 15 indicators on board. Obviously, our goal would be to have quite a few more than that. If we're going with the standard approach where you use an array and use differential responses across the array of elements in order to do detection, the more elements we can include in the package, the better off we'll be. <clears throat> so for algorithm development and for our first demonstrations, we were using an, an array of six. So my colleague, Jeff Erickson, designed this package, which has six of those commercial color sensors and a custom board. Um, for one-offs, these are about $1,000. That's about 10 times what we want to be charging per device ultimately, but it's a good place for us to start. Uh, also, these devices have had to be plugged into a wall, and they were USB communication, so you collect data for two weeks, and then you go and dump that data off onto the computer, and all of the algorithm was post-processing. So this is an example of the kind of data that we were getting. By the way, these prototypes have about 40,000 hours of operation time on them now, with more than 30,000 hours of that done in outdoor environments. So this isn't just pristine lab collected data that we've used to develop these algorithms. Uh, so the slowly undulating nature of this data is actually uh, diurnal changes in temperature and humidity. These are paper-supported indicators, so they are going to drift over time. They're porphyrins and metalloporphyrins, and you're flashing light on them, so they're going to fade over time. And the algorithm needs to take all of that into consideration if the device is going to continue to function for a period of six weeks or two months, whatever we're looking for. Um, we are not detecting these very slow changes with our algorithm. In fact, those very sharp changes that you can see here where the dashed lines are, are what we're trying to detect. So the algorithm has to be written in a way so that we're capturing the short duration changes that you see if you have an exposure while ignoring all those slow undulations. Um, this is ethanol, methanol, isopropanol for these exposures. These are not the only targets we've tested by any stretch of the imagination. This is what we're allowed to use outside on NRL's base. So you'll see a lot of our publications reflecting the fact that these are considered benign targets and we can go outside and spray them around. Uh, so this is the kind of change that we want to capture in the device, and we want to ignore those other kinds of behaviors. Uh, so this would give you a, a longer snapshot of what's possible with the, the sensor package. All right, so the algorithm was intended to have three tiers. And we have the first two tiers automated. The third tier we're still working on, which is pattern recognition for target identification. So what I'm going to talk about really is the second tier. The first tier basically excludes electronic noise if you get a one-point spike or a one-color spike on one device. The algorithm considers each of the six indicators, so each color uh, sensor independently, but it doesn't consider red, green, blue on a color sensor to be an independent result. Um, so how does it work? We're using a 120-point background window, so it takes us basically an hour to warm up the background window. That background window is used to fix, the first background window is used to fix threshold values. So how sensitive is the response going to be? 
And we do that background window every time because each color chip varies in its response characteristics. Each set of six color chips vary in their response characteristics. And each one of the porphyrin indicators will give you different variabilities and different behaviors. So by using a background window that's collected each time for each specific indicator on each specific chip, we get much better control over whether we're going to get a lot of false responses out of the device. And I'll tell you when that fails in just a minute. And then after we have that 120 point window for the background, we have an active window, which is 20 points long. And so that's going to give us the changes that we want, capture those short duration changes, but not give us those long duration changes. And then a snap window that's 10 points long, and that's for really big changes. So if you get exposed to something that's high concentration all at one time. So we're calculating slopes and we're using linear regression. And the reason we're taking this approach to analyzing the data is we really do want this to run light, really light, so that we can implement it on board, as opposed to needing a processor to deal with all the data all the time. And that allows each one of those devices to function independently to report on its particular circumstance, but also to be able to communicate back to a central site so that you can use them as a, a mesh network. Um, so we have the slope of the background window, we have the slope of an active window, and we compare those slopes if it exceeds the threshold, if the, the angle between them exceeds the threshold, we have a positive detection event. We also have an R squared um, requirement on that so that if you've got a sensor that fails for example basically what you get is a bunch of up and down random noise that would be excluded because the linear regression would have an R squared value that was inappropriate to uh, would be too small uh, to consider um, valid so this is what data looks like for a FOS gene evaluation and the reason I'm using this data is that we have lots of our outdoor data and it's published. This data has just recently been collected and we had to tweak our algorithm in order to perform in these independent tests. So this was done by the Army and they tested us against a number of TICTIM targets and also against some live agent, something that we can't do at NRO. Um, but their conditions were that we had to cut our warm-up time to less than half an hour so that means that we need our 120 point background window, our 20 point active window, our 10 point snap window, all populated in under half an hour. And we had to shorten, we have a cool down window at the end, so if you get a detection event, we have a 60 minute window, that anything happens in that hour, we call it part of the original event. They didn't like that, they wanted to be able to do exposures every 20 minutes or so, so we had to shorten that to five minutes. So this is where the algorithm can have issues. We do actually need 120 points to get a stable condition for the background. Otherwise, you have a background window that's changing basically as fast as your active window. So the windows slide, sorry, the windows slide together. So the 120 point original window slides forward one point each time you collect another point. That's how we're correcting for drift in the devices over time. So if you go down to a 15 minute background window, then your 15 minute background window is too short to give you a stable condition you start to get a lot of false responses. So what we did to accommodate this was we quadrupled the entry of the first 15 minutes into the uh, window. So you have four copies of the zero time point, four copies of the 30 second time point, four copies of the one minute time point to populate that. And that worked really well when we tested it in the lab. Uh, it failed when they tested it because they used the fans on my device to equilibrate the system. So while I was populating my background window to calculate a detection threshold, the humidity and temperature and everything else about the system was changing at the same time. So that was problematic for me. But I was able to go back retroactively and throw out the duration of time when their temperature and humidity was changing. So if you have stable conditions when you turn the device on, you can actually get really good performance. So this is showing you uh, four repeated exposures. And what I'm plotting on this side is the ratio of the active window to the background window. So you can see you get very crisp uh, response characteristics. So this would be positive response from seat one, two, three, and seat five, and negative responses from seat four and seat six, because they're below the thresholds for detection. So we were able to do this and apply it with array elements that we had optimized for the alcohol. So we had no way of optimizing our array elements for these targets. They're not something that we, well, phosgene we worked with a little bit, but the rest of these targets we hadn't worked with at all at NRL. So there was no way to optimize. 
However, we were able to take our alcohol array and let them test that. Um, and then, so under the original evaluation, which had that screwed up threshold based on the changing background, we didn't do particularly well. But if you go back and crop out that changing baseline and rerun the uh, analysis, you can see that you get pretty good behavior. So even though this device is not optimized for these particular targets, we are able to detect the things they're exposing it to, and we're able to separate that from background. Uh, so we weren't getting false responses, we were actually getting responses when we should be seeing responses. Uh, and they tested, like I said, a lot of different targets. There was sarin and simple green is a uh, commonly used interferent. Um, VX, uh, funny story, simple green is a commonly used interferent, so our array was specifically selected not to be sensitive to simple green. Um, but we just tested this device, which is the 15plex, so it uses the exact same algorithm for detection. The difference here is that we have eight LEDs and 15 indicator seats, so this is moving toward a, a much smaller, and this is much smaller than the other package that I was showing you. Uh, so moving to a smaller package with more indicators on board, requiring less power, so this can, on that pack of batteries that it's sitting on, on the top corner here, that can actually run for more days than the flash memory can hold data, so more than two weeks on those batteries. Uh, not with continuous communication, that's with burst communication. Uh, and we just tested these devices, uh, six of them, and a star network confirmation. So the engineer is still working on how to make them mesh properly, but they will communicate all back to a central point. Uh, and the target that was selected for that independent evaluation was methyl salicylate, which is the thing in simple green that we've been selecting arrays uh, to be not sensitive to for the last five years. Uh, so we had a quick readjustment of our uh, array elements to be able to capture that target. So this is what the package looks like when it's in the housing, and this is what the current user interface looks like. Uh, this was tested in Denver with the Pepsi Center in combination with, with NCS4, which is the National Council for Sports Security and Safety, and something else, probably. Anyway, so basically right now the uh, device, all six sensors report back to the laptop at all at one time. This is not an onboard implementation. This is still a software implementation, so we're just taking data in real time by wireless communication. And then you get both a reporting on the individual seats, so the 15 elements of the array for each device, and you also get reporting for whether the device is in a positive status or a negative status. So this one that's red here, if the event ended, each one of those seats would go gray, but the event would still stay red for the overall device for five minutes, then that would go to yellow, and for the next 55 minutes it would stay yellow in that there's been an event and we're in the cool down window, unless you're running it under the Army's conditions, in which case that window would only last for five minutes. Um, so this is where we are right now. Uh, we're currently looking at uh, ways to implement our algorithm on the board, because that's where we want it. And we are still working on uh, identifying targets based on pattern recognition and relative response across the array. Uh, that would be my colleague, Anthony Malinowski, who's working on that, who should be standing here right now. <laughs> um, we have a large number of contributors to this work, including quite a few HBCU interns. Uh, NRL has a lot of different programs for engaging with students. So if you have students who are looking for postdoc positions, you have students who are looking for summer internships, I, I strongly suggest you reach out. You can find it on NRL's website or you can ask me and I'll give you a card where you can find it. Uh, and we're in collaboration right now with Smith Detection and Airview. Airview is actually taking this package and trying to put it on UAVs to do some monitoring in urban environments. And Smith Detection is trying to adapt the package to something appropriate to commercial fabrication so that it can be used by the Army. Okay, thank you very much.